Kiwi is he's a great coach. Is about everything else. It's not only these techniques. Who mm -hmm. is the guy? Folks is always agile. We all know the music, how the music is written. Mm. What is inspiring for me is how your your interpretation of the music. This is fascinating for me. You you think about a whole the whole thing. So it's how the pieces are going together, how the pieces are speaking together. And these pieces are mostly humans. So indeed, mm -hmm. if you're in, with software developers, you you're thinking about this. But when, uh, IT is dead for me. It makes no sense. It means a, a team is a mix of everything. Is mm -hmm. is not only one single thing, but always having this quality first idea. So one another topic we have a huge fight is always safe, mm -hmm. um, scaling. Uh, uh, let's say let's make it easier. Uh, let's keep it agnostic. The idea of scaling. Yeah, this can be a huge debate. Uh, I'm tired with that topic. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but there's still, the but there are, scaling. but every day there is a new long line of people who need to hear about it. Every day there is an, a long line of new people who, uh, who don't understand the, they just assume that scaling is a good thing uh, and that they need to do it. So we need to show them that, well, explain to them maybe why it's not uh, the place to start. Yeah, and, and also is to giving the full context, one of the, the kick off of this big, agile, some people say industry. Now, I just peep, everyone wants to be agile. Mm -hmm. Came first from Gartner saying, hey, if you're not agile, you're dead in the five yeah. years they come. And then came this Howard Business Review article about agile at scale. And this was the gold rush, right? And since then, people are still referring on that article. And we are now trying to address, Agile is trying to address that every single methodology, even waterfall, never touched at all. <laughs> and we try to solve the problem. Hmm. Yes, I, and I, I certainly prefer to start by questioning how big do we really need to be? There is a reason why my company never grows that big. Uh, and I never wanted my company to grow that big. And I'm not interested to try to make any company grow that big. I like to say maximizing is a Western disease, <laughs> just like uh, diabetes. Yeah. Uh, I had another shock. Uh, I watched Trevor Noah. Hmm. Trevor Noah is something you can see on, on Facebook. It was something about a, a joke about British colonization of India. Like, <laughs> yeah, and I just are laughing, and they say, "Oh damn!" I say, "Oh, colonization is the highest uh, proof of arrogance, thinking yeah. that what you know it's better than what others know." I say, "They say, and they say, oh shit, this is exactly what we are doing since years now." Oh no! Ah, uh, good. So that that okay. if we if we go that bring that point up because then that will allow me to talk about one of my formative experiences from nearly twenty years ago. The question that, uh, I'll, I'll wait, the question that um, continues to plague us as a group where I still can't seem to find any answers. All right, so I think we have, we have enough things to start with, so mm. let's do it. Let's do it. Pierre? Hey, why Pierre? Alex? <laughs> let's start it. Let's start it. We have topics. You want topics with the, the scale uh, framework and thing like this. So my point of view is that company that think that if they use one of these framework and they come and I see too many company that they take their organization, they take one of the scale framework and they come like this and try to say, okay, I'm gonna keep my organization and oh, okay, it's fit. Voila, I'm agile. And they're completely wrong. Because they are in a, the first thing is he didn't understand what is agile. That's why Pierre, every time you enter in a company like me, I enter and I ask my first question. I have two silly questions on company when I enter. It's first, what is agile for you? What, what is your agile? And what is your DevOps? DevOps is the most funny things because I think at nearly 90%, even more than 90% of the company, they see DevOps just 
by putting a few servers together and we have continuous delivery, voila, ta-da. And ta-da, it's not working. Why? I, but I spent one million. Why it's not working? So we still have a lot of job. Uh, that's nice. That's, in, that's a very good one. That's a good one. That's, a, that's quite good, proper one. I have uh, assisted to debates with very global companies where they felt that DevOps was just merging, build and run. Scaling is, is, is a big topic. So I had sometimes calls from people from the USA saying, hey, Pierre, are you available? Uh, we, we want to get Germany, uh, Europe and, and the Middle East aligned with, on our methodology and we implement SAFE and uh, we want to have this. Just SAFE on the, as an example, right? I say, uh, I say, okay, got you. What is the problem you want to solve? Mm. Is it, oh, we want to implement SAFE. I say, sorry. Uh, uh, it has nothing to do. You can say, I want to implement Kanban. will be exactly the same uh, reaction right. of my side. That's not the problem. Then you go in the companies. Another example is they make one year SAFE. The next year, they do less. Then they will make the third year scrum at scale. Is to say, what are you doing? Is, is it entertainment or what? Is well, not... in many cases, it is. Yeah, and sometimes you have so concept and words, mind-opening concept and words. So what is happening here, right? One thing was we want to have the big, uh, we want to cut the big whale into a swarm of fishes. So it was a slogan. Mm. It was on the VUCA point. So it means we have to think differently. Yeah, that's completely it. It's a big, big corporation that know that their growth just going through margin acquisitions, it doesn't work any longer. Because you, if you work in a big company, you say, oh, we merged 10 years ago. You say, where's the merger? <laughs> Maybe you change the brands and the logo, but you still have this segregation of everything. So merger doesn't work. And here the stepping back is you have the new trend, and I do believe this is coming up in the next years, is stepping back of not thinking big, but thinking small and, and swift. Well, wow. so there's one aspect of, of Agile that I think, I get the feeling that not many people have this conversation. And that is, so yes, you can ask, when you say Agile, what do you have in mind? Or you can ask, uh, what does Agile look like for you? If we do, if we did it, if we uh, transformed your company perfectly, what would it look like in your mind? Or we can ask, what kinds of benefits are you expecting? But one of the things that um, one of the things that I'm not sure businesses understand enough is that incremental project work has a bias towards cash flow over long-term investment and. So that's why I try to make a point of asking that question. Um, are you looking to increase cash flow or are you looking to increase long-term return on investment? Because if they want to increase long-term return on investment, then maybe iterative development could be useful. But I'm not sure that incremental delivery is useful because incremental, incremental delivery is at its heart about realizing earned value earlier. It's about increasing cash flow, turning the tap on sooner and getting more cash in your pocket. And if they're not interested in that, if that's not important to them, if they only care about putting their money in the magic box and leaving the magic box for three years and then hoping that there's 50% more money in the magic box in three years, then... All these suggestions that we have about incremental delivery seem like a complete waste of time. It seems like, it seems like um, call it business theater. It, it then just becomes a new ceremony for no reason. But for a company that desperately needs to increase cash flow over the next three months, all of a sudden incremental delivery to real paying customers uh, becomes significant and important. Um, so I will ask them, are you... Are you interested in this stuff because you want cash in your pocket sooner? And if they don't immediately say yes, then that's a signal to me that we're going to have a problem trying to, then I know maybe what we are doing is using something like technical coaching as a way to increase the capacity of the programmers, but not in a way that the company is going to be able to turn into profit soon.
because they're still thinking about putting their money in and getting it out in three or five year, 10 years, uh, and not thinking about what can I do with a thousand euro this week? What can I do with 10,000 euro this week? What can I do with a hundred thousand euro this month? Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's one thing that seems to happen over and over again. Um, by asking that cash flow question, it's much easier to figure out that they have a very different idea of how they don't have, I wouldn't say that they don't know how Agile is supposed to help them, but they have a very different idea of how Agile is supposed to help them. And it might be as vague as one of my golfing buddies told me this would be a good idea, so I'm going to try it. Or it be more. But I, I worry that if they don't have, it's, it's the typical theory of constraints issue, right? If you don't have if you don't have a plan for exploiting more capacity, then building more capacity could be as much of a risk as it is a benefit. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember um, a company that I finished uh, a few months ago to coach them for, uh, for nearly two years. Uh, they decided to put one of these fancy frameworks and, and, and it was this. They were asking the team to deliver every two weeks but at the end, when you were measuring how much time it took from one ID to come from the customer to the team to delivery, it was taking something like three months or more to be delivered. Yeah. And that was showing that the people were not wait. They, were, they didn't have the needed to have a fast delivery. They were just fancy. It was just making fancy to show, hey, you wanted to work for, for us? Come to us. We have fancy stuff. We can make continuous delivery. We're doing yes. this, this, this. This can be funny. Okay, delivery, time to market. Or if it's coming in three, six months, it's fine for us. This is a perfect example of a big misconception, a big uh, misunderstanding about um, how to use any kind of, whether it's technical coaching or, um, you know, business change for Agile, that, um, and it's something we've been talking about for 20 years and uh, not enough people are hearing. So in music, you have this concept of an etude, right? So finger exercises for piano are very boring. And so if you want to build strength in the fingers, you can do finger exercises, but they are boring and frustrating, so you give up. And then if you try to play complicated pieces, you don't have enough strength, you don't have enough flexibility, and you can't do it. So in the middle, you have etudes, right? Which are finger exercises that sound more like music. And so the idea is that as you are playing the finger the etudes, you get many of the benefits of finger exercises, but it feels more like music. So it's more interesting, it's more enjoyable, and maybe you'll play in more. And so, um, at the beginning of the, uh, not long after uh, extreme programming became uh, known in the early 2000s, a handful of us started to talk about the practices as etudes because there was this common mistake of adopting extreme programming practices and, and well, really adopting the four extreme programming practices that are the easiest to adopt, just putting it on top of your team and then you wait two months and you wonder why the world hasn't changed and nothing is better because they just take some, some tricks off the shelf and do them and expect magic to happen. And part of the point of etudes is to be, is to not because they are better, but because they help you figure out what else you need to practice. They help you be more aware of, the mechanics of playing the piece. And then you, once you master that, it becomes easier for you to figure out when you need to do those things later. And viewing these practices as etudes, the goal is not to do the practices, right? The goal is to do the practices well enough so that you understand something more about your environment and when you need those practices and when you don't. So for example, um, you could, use the, you could use the continuous delivery etude, the frequent releases etude, and say, we're gonna try to release something to the customer every two weeks. And the naive person will just say, we should do this because Kent Beck said it's a good idea and so we're going to do it and everything will be better. 
And the less naive person will say, we're going to try to do this for a few months and it will tell us something about where our problems lie. It will tell us something about what really we need to do. And one of the possible outcomes is exactly the one that you describe, Alex, where we release, we, you know, in three months, we become quite skilled at releasing every two weeks. And then we notice that our wonderfully crafted, well-tested, released software is sitting on some server somewhere and nobody's using it. And then we go ask the question, well, why is nobody using it? And somebody in customer relations or account management or any of these kinds of departments says, well, um, none of our clients are willing to take the risk of installing new software more often than three times per year. Uh, or we haven't found, we haven't found a perfect market for this software yet. So we don't have enough of a customer base to justify releasing this to real customers, uh, so frequently yet, or we have such a bad reputation in the market that if we try to release more often, uh, it doesn't work. We need to earn their trust back before we can uh, convince them actually to use it. This doesn't mean that frequent releases failed. It just means that frequent releases didn't have the outcome you wanted. You want to be able to increase cash flow, and instead what you found out is that the cash flow bottleneck is somewhere else in the system. Now you can do it that way, and that's a little bit the long way. Or if you know a little bit of theory, you could look for, you could ask the question from theory of constraints or from some other, um, some other way of thinking. If we reduce this feedback loop, what information are we going to get? How useful is that information? And is something else blocking that information from being useful? If we all know that the, feed, that the long feedback loop is in the market instead of in delivering features, then we know that frequent releases could be good for us as an etude to build strength in our fingers, but it's not going to result in more cash. It's not going to result in better business results. And that okay strategy if we know that more frequent releases are going to lead to better skill in the better skill with the programmers and testers and project managers and not better results for the business that way we're not going to be disappointed when of course we don't get better results from the business because the bottleneck is in marketing or the bottleneck is in sales or somewhere else and so i think this is you know Practicing the practices gives you uh, a different view on where the problems might be in your system. They're not, but as long as, as long as people have this feeling that they are magic rules, that when they follow the rules, then good things will happen, they will correctly, they'll do exactly what Pierre mentioned earlier. They'll try safe for one year and nothing will change. And then they'll try less for one year and nothing will change. And then they'll try... Uh, scrum at scale and nothing will change. And then they'll do small pilot projects for a year and nothing will change because they haven't, they haven't asked the important question, what problems do we think this is going to solve? What benefits do we think this is going to provide? Or even if they ask that question, let's even be more generous. Even if they ask that question, somehow the people who are involved in the work don't understand enough to be able to offer them some possible answers to that question. There's and, another one. Right? And that can happen when someone who calls themselves a coach is too much enamored with selling solutions and not enough interested in, the, in understanding problems. And I was guilty of that as much as anyone until I finally had five years of experience and realized that there's something outside the world of my IDE and writing tests. And one of the first questions we always uh, forgot to ask, which I do believe is one mine of my favorites is, okay, you want to do something new, you want to go that way, okay. What would you like to stop doing? Mm. Because usually you're on the rush, yeah, right? And so you oh yes, we can do it. You're happy you get a customer and you need the, you need the money. Okay, that's, that's okay. But then you say, oh, damn, I made a mistake because you can, you can, you can make a, re a rewind, right? Mm. But the real question is, guys, okay, you believe, you, you got it. You, you know the values of doing Agile or whatever, and we will use maybe that map. You got it. Fine. What should we stop now by now doing? 
This is maybe one of the biggest things that people do not understand. And sorry, I, sh I, I shouldn't say it that way. Uh, I prefer not to say it that way. This is something that so few people understand. It, it, it worries me. Um, and it, one of those things, again, we've been talking about this for nearly 20 years, captured extremely well by the phrase, sooner, not faster. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make, and I don't think it's just about scale, but at trying to introduce Agile at any level. They have this picture in their mind that Agile will help them go faster. And uh, this is one of those incidents where I happen to be in the same building as, uh, as another person in our, in our uh, tribe, uh, Tim Ottinger, and uh, we were talking about this exact issue. It's right in the Agile Manifesto, right? It's one of the principles uh, that says, uh, simplicity, the art of maximizing work not done yeah. is essential. Um, and so we were talking about this and I was rambling like I normally do. And then he just said, oh yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we're, uh, when we adopt agile ways of working, we're trying to finish things sooner, not go faster. And part of the benefit of part of the point of that so first of all, that hit me like a ton of bricks, like, oh shit, you, don't, you know that experience when someone else says something so perfectly that you've been saying with a hundred words for many years? Yeah, it happened all the time. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I love it because then I steal that immediately. As soon as Tim said sooner, not faster, I just said, oh, perfect. And immediately uh, that became a staple of, um, of any work that I did. And so I say it this way. Uh, so, you know, one of the essences of Agile is cash flow. If you don't care about increasing cash flow, maybe you don't want Agile. Another, as, another essence of it is to figure out the 70% of things that you should not be doing and then stop doing them. And that's part of how you get to sooner. It's not because we type more quickly. It's not because we, we do the same things more quickly, although that does help or it can help. Um, it's, we need to figure out the things that we should stop doing and then have the courage to stop doing them. That's one of the reasons that courage was one of the five values of extreme programming. Um, simplicity and courage go together with this phrase, let's figure out what we should stop doing and then stop doing it. Um, and even just as you say, Pierre, just asking them directly, what would you like to stop doing? I think it reminds people that they have permission to stop doing things. Yeah. And, then when we, and then when we give them this principle from the Agile Manifesto, we tell them they have a duty, they have a responsibility to stop doing things. First, they have to feel maybe some permission before they're willing to try. Um, because otherwise, then we have to say, well, then let's engineer a crisis so that people will stop doing it. And he, so when you have the session or the workshop or the training, people came out, yeah, that's it, the burning hot, right? Yeah. Or like the, the budget say, Show coming baraka frit, the burning hot, right? And 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 the next day is exactly the, the opposite, right? Yeah. And this this was my pain. So I, I ask with coaches and psychologists, and I get this what you say, the, the catching phrase is just the point. It was I guess I, I watched a thing about uh, behavioral things, and a, a, a German physicist say. <clears throat> they have a locked in syndrome mm -hmm. and they say and I, this catch my brain so like you have you don't know why you have this bubbling is the epiphany is coming up in your brain you, yes, say, what? you say hold oh, on that that's where our job is as coaches we yeah. are not trainers uh, we we have a, a part of training yeah we're not trainers yeah uh, and sometimes i have no training at all mm. which is okay but our job is to to help people to get out from this lockdown syndrome is yeah. embodying, coming from the brain to the belly, you know? And yes. then you, you talk here. And then you know, ha, ah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to tell people uh, that uh, my presence is a good excuse for them to do things which are not normal. Mm -hmm. So I give them the opportunity to do it, maybe in a way that they would not take this opportunity on their own because they're afraid of their job, because they're afraid of society, of uh, social pressure, blah, blah, blah. But also that I'm there 
to support them as they try to do these things so that they feel like they have some recovery strategy, even if their recovery strategy is just cry to JB and maybe he has a suggestion. That's a start. Um, that they have some kind, they feel like they have support as they try to do these things. Because if they don't, if they don't uh, feel like they have permission to start, and if they feel like they don't have uh, the safety net of a recovery mechanism when things go wrong, then of course uh, they they it makes sense that they that they don't try anything. I wouldn't. I don't try anything in those situations. If failure is a serious consequence for me, then obviously I'm going to sit here until the crisis forces me to change something. I, I'm no different from anyone else. Part of the reason to build slack into your life is that is a form of recovery strategy, and part of the reason to, for example, to do improve at technical practices, even if you're not going to increase business results, is that gives, you extra, uh, that gives you extra capacity that you can use to recover from mistakes. And that gives you an opportunity to learn. So yeah, in a lot of cases, a lot of what I'm doing, we start by having discussions about technical topics, or we start with having discussions about how to adopt practices, or we start with discussions about, even if we have nicer discussions about you know, how to negotiate with people outside of the technical group or how do we get technical oriented people and business oriented people to communicate better. Ultimately, almost all the real work starts with figuring out how to increase uh, excess capacity so that you have room to experiment so that failure is not a disaster with reminding them that failure is not the goal. The goal I, it bugs me when people say fail fast. My goal is not to fail more efficiently. My goal is to make the co is to make the consequences of failure lower. This is another area where I think people have a, a big misunderstanding. Everyone knows the basics of risk management where you you make some some list of all your key risks and you you make some guess about how much it will cost if you fail and you make some guess about how much the probability is that you will fail. And then you take the probability and you multiply it by the cost and you get some number and you add them all up. And at the end, you have a number that says 5.7 million euro. And then you make sure that there are 5.7 million euro in the bank or you have an insurance policy for 5.7 million euro and then it's safe to try. And so people have this picture then when they think about how to apply practices, it's technical practices or something else, it doesn't matter they think that their number one goal in life is to reduce the probability of failure. And you don't. That, that number, that 5.7 million euro, remember how we calculated it? We multiplied the probability of failure by the cost of failure. So if you make one of those go towards zero, then the whole thing goes towards zero, right? It doesn't matter so much if you try to reduce the cost of failure or the probability of failure. You pick whichever one is easier. And many of the waterfall practices focus on reducing the probability of failure and many of the agile practices focus on reducing the cost of failure. They're just two fundamentally different philosophies about how to reduce risk. So this is another one of those key questions that you can ask people to understand what they're thinking. You teach them this very basic thing about risk management, probably they already know it, and then you ask them, okay, what's your favorite strategy for reducing your exposure? And if they focus on if they focus on reducing the probability of failure, then the discussions that you need to have with them, the kind of training that they might need, the kind of books that you might suggest, the kind of discussions that you'll have with them over coffee or wine or whiskey or whatever, will be different than if they already tell you that they try to balance mistake to this difference between faster. So about how they're going to build the system. They make a perfect project plan. They make a perfect marketing plan. And then they try it once and they hope that it works. And of course it doesn't. And that leads to the bigger, bigger is, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, Kent Beck invite, uh, asked people to come to, essentially to come to his town uh, when he was living in Southern Oregon near the California border. He said, come with me for a weekend and we're going to try to discuss a very important question. This was, I think in 2003. He, uh, he said, okay, we've been doing this extreme programming stuff for over five years. Scrum has been around for 10 years. 
why aren't we all rich yet? So we have really good ideas. Why aren't we rich yet? And the, what, you know, we, we, a few of us went there. We had some pleasant discussions. We didn't really come to many conclusions, but there was this central question of we have all the good ideas. They have all the money. How can this be? Obviously, we're very smart. We know exactly what to do. We know how to run these projects. We know how to run these programs. We know how to build software we're more effectively with better cash flow with better social harmony um, with better outcomes for the workers, with better outcomes for the customers so why don't we have all the money yet and that's the part that i really don't understand too well except i can only reach one conclusion which is that the economy at some point we will we will hit brick wall, which is the economic system around us, the economic system in which we participate as individuals and as companies, which is inherently phased and plan and plan focused and uh, it's waterfall or it's chaos, but it's certainly not lean agile in any useful way. Uh, and that, and no matter what we try to do, we are always going to hit that brick wall. Um, um, I, I can see small changes. I completely agree with you. It's a very good demonstration. And I was thinking myself, why I'm not rich at all with my superb ideas that I'm the only one in the whole world is using. There's two things about this. One, I learned how to play the game. I learned how to avoid the game. So I'm lucky that some people introduced me to some books at the right time of my life when I was, you know, in my mid twenties, um, that it helped me get away from sort of the typical Western disease of maximizing salary and spending uh, 4% more than you earn uh, to accumulate things that sit in your big house, which is bigger than you need, blah, 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 all those things. I read books like uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad and Your Money or Your Life, and it taught me the meaning of enough. And so that, that my needs are more modest, so then I don't try to maximize everything. And there's a, very, there's a very agile feeling about that. There's a very extreme programming feeling about that, right? Remember one of the rallying cries of extreme programming. What is the least we can do and still build great software? Now, you, okay, with agile, you can argue about whether we should focus so much on just building software, but you can apply the same principle everywhere, right? Absolutely. What is the, what is the least I can buy and enjoy my life and still live a great life? What is the least I can earn and still build a great and still uh, lead a great life? Um, and that is, again, that's one of those essential agile concepts that when you ask people, what kind of agile is your agile? I don't hear that very often. And if you don't, when you find that someone already understands that philosophy of enough, then when you teach them about extreme programming or lean or Kanban or any of these, they are much more likely to just say, oh, of course, of course you should work that way. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, it's obvious. Yeah. But uh, I had my, my 20s, they were absolutely cheaper than yours. I didn't have to buy these books at all for the same results. My background was called family. <laughs> yeah, what I didn't have it. What are you doing? Do you need this big car? Do you need a Ferrari just to go shopping around the corner? Take the bicycle. <laughs> yeah. I, I, grew up in, I grew up in a household that was not poor, but was, you know, uh, maybe on the, in the lower half. And so I had the experience of understanding the need to conserve but I never had the experience of needing to use excess money responsibly. So then suddenly when I started working at IBM and was making quite a healthy salary and living in uptown Toronto and slowly moving from apartment to apartment every two years and every apartment became 150 euro per month more expensive, I could already see that I was falling into this trap because I never had, I, I learned how to conserve, but I never learned how to use excess capacity responsibly. And that was another, that was part of the reason why I needed that. And then when I read about theory of constraints, a lot of those ideas really became easier for me to understand. And I could apply them equally well in life as in, uh, as in work 
either work for myself or work in, in coaching other people. Another example is bubbling up in my mind. I'm very sorry for that. Is, um, I, I grew up, uh, well, just not in the middle, but a little bit tall. We were the notorious. Uh, for our, our, my families, you have to be smart first. First, you have to be smart. And, and, and I, I had a very good friends, very, some very poor and some very, very, very rich. And when I say very rich, it's very old family, rich family in centuries, yes. right? And, and the, you have the concept of nouveau riche in, in French. Means yes. the, the guy who is just driving a Ferrari, which people, rich people say, <laughs> no way. And very rich people that just come with a bicycle, they look humble. And, and I had the conversation, I guess I was in my 70s with my friend, they say, hey, hey you, you come here, you're like us, which is okay. And I, I discovered that your family and you have a particle in your name means aristocracy, you see. And that, and is that your family? Is that, is, yeah. And, you say, and then you start you know, sparkling your eyes, and wow, and dreaming castle, big cars, blah, 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 blah. They, yeah, yeah, that's the show. That's the show. And it's not me, it's maybe my own. And she's not the number one, she's just number five. But I give you, I, I tell you one story. Um, I, I will get money, I will get when my parents are dying, I will have a heritage, I'll get a, a, a huge fortune. And we have a rule in the family is if you get this fortune, you have to increase the fortune to give away. That's not yours. It's the fortune of your children. This was 17, put your feet on the, on the earth and say, huh, uh, you're not the gecko, greed is good. Nah, has, this has about this legacy. And, and, and this is quite helpful, is clean your mind about nonsense. But even though I came from the other way, I came from the sea, I started my career at sea level. So, uh, and, and coming back on our uh, initial point, uh, Judy, what, what the two, two points didn't match up, it's just about communication. Uh, you don't have the same people, so we have geeks, it's about, we wear commodities all now, now we have our methodology, let us have our freedom, and we just can understand, that's okay. And, and why this doesn't work, why we are not, we are not rich and famous, uh, I'm famous with my daughters, that's enough. And, and it, it's because we still, everything is still based on functional silos. You have this clustering, right? So you have this, a lot of noise. And even though if you can't go in this, this system thing, in which the earlier told lean, I'm coming from lean thinking before agile. It was, we, we fight against silos. And here we have exactly the same thing. Remove these bloody silos, solve problems. And, and then you will have some kind of the place to do things that matters. But you are still the same issues that we had 20 years ago. Yeah, and so for me, I, and part of what I try to do when, when, uh, you know, when I work with clients is to show them the well i don't like to phrase it that way um, i like to look for alignment between what i believe are the strongest benefits of agile of lightweight ways of working in general um, and to try to help find out whether they have first at the superficial level do they have an expectation that matches the way that I understand lightweight approaches will help them. In other words, do they have already just the wrong picture of what is probably going to happen if they try and then try to go behind that and genuinely find out if they, if their needs, if their, if their needs in the situation, their personal needs, their professional needs match what lightweight approaches are likely to give them. And if they don't, then, I could just say, don't do this, right? That, and some people would probably argue that I should say, don't do this. I actually don't agree with that anymore. I used to think that. Now, instead, I think I try to tell them that 
if you try to adopt, so first you should probably try to limit your lightweight approach to this smaller part of the system where you have more control. And that could be, for example, a single uh, feature group, or it could be a handful of feature groups, but say, don't include marketing, don't include sales, don't include the finance department. And say, limit your, limit your, um, your experimentation here. And be aware that there are really only two things that are going to happen. Uh, in the best case, you'll achieve two goals. One, you'll increase the capacity in that part of the system. So whatever that system does, it will do it better. And you'll be able to build uh, excess capacity. And the second thing is, you're going to create tension at the boundary between the part that you change and the parts that you don't. I used to think that that's bad, right? I used to think all excess capacity just leads to creating excess inventory, which is waste. Goldrat taught us that. Clearly, we all know that by now. And I also used to think that creating that tension is going to lead to conflict. That conflict is going to lead to chaos. And then eventually the whole thing will implode. And now I prefer to think that that's just one possible outcome. That another possible outcome is that if you build excess capacity, as long as you are prepared to set fire to the excess inventory every week, as long as you're prepared to throw away, as long as you do not try to produce the wrong thing, or if you do produce the wrong thing, you feel comfortable to throw it away because it was the wrong thing, then you are building capacity. And at the point when that tension, the conflict with other parts of the organization, as that resolves more, then it's like you've built this great engine that once the rest of the organization understands how to use the engine, then the engine will take you someplace great. But do not expect more than that. And what that means in particular is that business results are not going to go up. In fact, they might go down a tiny bit. You might have some minor successes. Those successes will feel better for you than they will for the rest of the business. And that might be okay. That might be enough to make you feel better about your job. If that stops you from, if that, delays the day when you quit your job for two years, or if that makes you feel less stressed when you go home in the evening, if that allows you to enjoy your vacation more, if that means that you do not have to worry about uh, uh, picking up your phone at the beginning of the day and reading your work email because it's okay, nothing is that urgent, I can do it when I go to the office, in the future when we have offices again, then uh, that's great. Already that's, a, that's an improvement. As long as your expectation is there, probably you'll feel more like it's a success. Um, but maybe nobody has had that conversation with that client before. They just heard from some golfing buddy or read some articles or something about how uh, lean, agile, lightweight Kanban scrum is going to transform their organization and do more with less and blah, 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 um, without really understanding the fundamental changes that are involved. When they, it's just like the people who say, I should never practice anything because I'm not the bottleneck. Therefore, there's no point in improving in this part of the system. No, 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 no. It just means that the benefit is limited. The risk if you improve away from the bottleneck is that you create excess inventory. Okay, so build a plan for either burning the excess inventory or for avoiding to create it. And if that that you sit in the corner for two, day, for two hours per day and you practice something that improves your skill and then you throw away that work. But now in a, in a high pressure environment, you work more effectively, more quickly, you get finished sooner, you work with less stress, you sustain your energy more. That's great. Even if you only get to really exploit that benefit a few times a year in some small crisis. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't waste your, it just means that if you, if you know you can improve something closer to the bottleneck and you spend time improving here instead, bad employee. You cannot influence that other part of the system if you can't do anything there. If you need to win hearts and minds and build trust and improve communication or read some books to learn about marketing before you can advise the marketing department, then in the meantime, if you have two hours that day and you want to get better at writing tests or you want to get better at, at drawing value streams or you want to get better at uh, communicating with people, 
even if that benefit will only come in a year or two years, that's fine. Or you could just sit back and relax. Any of that will work. There are two things, two stories I tell. One story I love to tell when I do managers or leaders uh, meetups um, or coaching. The first is, oh, what, what is the problem? Then you get emails or whatever. Okay, okay, let's open Outlook. Show me your emails. Okay, let's now, all the emails older than 10 days, throw away in the bin. Okay. Now let's create a CC ruler. You have the CC folder. So everything that is a CC goes in the folder. What's left? Okay, these, how old are there? Now of these, all, everything older than five days in the bin. And okay, now take your CC folder, put it in the bin too. What's left? Okay, and, and this is quite helpful because it's here, the distraction, um, the level of distraction, you need to be informed about everything. This letting go is even the, 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 the term delegation, I don't like it. So if you delegate some work, it means you're still under, over the, you're always controlling that work. Uh, he is, you have to empower somebody. It's not delegate, you're giving the job and you're not caring about it. Empower the thing, you're not delegating. So you don't need assistance to do things. So it's full away. And this, uh, this is em highly emotional. Here comes the really the psychological part of one-to-one -one coaching things. And, 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 and the people you have in front of you, they, they suffer a hell to let this thing go. But once it's done, change your life. Then I have time, and then comes the point, you know what's, what, you know Warren Buffett? Rich Warren. Do you know what he's doing every day, all the time? He's reading books and the press, nothing more. The, um, I, 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 I should probably bring it back. I used, to, I used to play around with doing some workshops to see what people would buy, and one of them I called um, uh, manufacturing slack, because most people don't understand there's actually a way that you can build Slack into your system if you just, not just, but if there are certain techniques that you can use that will help you. Because most people have a lot of excess capacity. It's just sitting there lying around everywhere and they just don't use it because they stay busy with things that, that uh, don't actually result in, in, that don't actually convert into results. So it's similar to the, the, the email that you're describing. That whole idea is a, a special case of it. One of the things that I do that tries to um, that tries to come to the emotion of it is uh, a trick. I don't remember if I invented it or if I read it somewhere. I'm sure I read it. Most people have this. Pro okay, so it starts with the book planning extreme programming, where I learned the phrase "too much to do" instead of "I don't have enough time." As long as you say you don't have enough time, then you are you have this locked-in syndrome where you feel like you can't solve the problem because the physicists still have not learned how to create time yet. Yep. So instead you start to say, I have too much to do, which then gives you the option of doing less. That goes back to the sooner, not faster, have the courage to stop doing things, stuff that we talked about earlier. Okay. Uh, yeah, that sounds good in theory, JB. Uh, but I, you know, I really do have to do all this stuff. I said, okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's really explore this. Take out a piece of paper and write down a list of all the projects that you ev that you want to do. So these are all the things that you have committed to doing and all the things that you want to do. And let's use the, the, the term project to just mean anything that requires more than one task. So we'll use it in the sort of getting things done style of what project means. So project doesn't have to be a big thing. It's just anything that requires more than one task. That's a project. You have projects that you have committed to already. You have some projects that you are planning to do and you have some projects that you want to do but you maybe don't know when you're going to start, blah, blah, blah. Write it all down. Just all you have to do is write down the names of the projects on a piece of paper. Most people will have somewhere between 25 and 100 of them, depending on at what level or size they're thinking about these things. And it's okay. So they spend five minutes, 10 minutes, and they write all these things down. And usually if you just, if you just let the timer go, 
they think they finished and then they go, oh, right, I want to do that too. And they write it down and you give them another 30 seconds. They think of five more. You give them another minute. They think of 10 more and then eventually they're done. So, okay. So, you know, look at your list. It's very nice. It's pleasant. There are some things that they don't like on the list, but they're forced to do it because they made some commitment before. And as they go to the bottom of the list, usually they start to see more of the things that they want to do. They're smiling. They feel happier about these ideas. Okay, great. Now, let's do the one thing that I don't like to do. Let's make a guess about how long it will take to finish these projects. It doesn't have to be a very accurate guess. Just an upper bound is good enough. Some projects are small enough that you will think about them at the level of days or weeks. Some projects are big enough that it will take months or years, maybe even decades. I don't know. Make a guess. I try not to use the word estimate. Make a guess. Put it down. And just write down next to each project, how long do you think it will take to finish? Two weeks, four weeks, four months, two years, three months, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes they're not sure and I just have to go, an upper bound is enough. Actually, don't even put an upper bound, put a lower bound. I know it will take at least two weeks. I know it will take at least one month. I know it will take at least one year. Doesn't have to be very, very accurate, just some good guess. And by that point, some of them are guessing what the next instruction will be, right? And of course, you've guessed too that you now add up all the numbers. So add up all the numbers and at the end, you have some number at the end. Drop all the units of time that are lower than the top two units, which are usually either years and months or decades and years. So it depends on whether you like to think in decades or not. Some people will even get to centuries. So now at the end, it says something like 66 years. And then, uh, and then we do the difficult part. So then I say, okay, so you have 66 years worth of projects that you have committed to or that you want to do. How old are you now? Add 66. What is the probability that you will still be alive at that age? And so then, exactly. For most of them, it's, it's zero or close to it, right? So then I hope the light bulb goes on. There are all these things that you are committed to doing, that you plan to do, that you want to do. And already, you have more projects. You will die before you finish your list even if you never have another good idea in the rest of your life. So are you going to stop yourself from having good ideas? Probably not. So you are going to have to make peace with the magic phrase, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it, right? We had, you aren't going to need it. And that helped programmers to stop building too much code. And now we have, you're not going to do it, which helps people begin to make peace with the fact that they are going to have to allow themselves to not do things. That's the way where you can give them a crisis where they start to give themselves permission to not do things. And then they have this little heart attack, this miniature heart attack, <laughs> or have this miniature crisis of confidence, or have this miniature anxiety feeling. Uh, and then we can really start to say, okay, but you know you aren't going to do that whole list. So you don't have a choice. You have to say no to some things. Now let's talk about what you're having specific difficulty saying no to, and let's figure out how to make that helpful. And that, that will help them a little bit with managing the emails and managing their calendar and all these other things. But it has to begin with the, we have to break them of the illusion that they can do everything. So I have a pattern name for this in my trainings. Is it stop being a nice boy? Well, that's part of it. So that's one specific instance of the problem, right? So why do you think you, why do you keep signing up for these things if you know you're not going to be able to do them? We've mm -hmm. just demonstrated. We've, yeah. We have created an arithmetic proof that you won't do it all. So why do you insist on trying? And that usually one of those, you know, if I ask why two or three times, then we get to something that makes them, where they give the answer in a way that their voice makes them sound afraid. Where you can hear their heart is breaking. Because they get to something like, well, because if I don't do this all, then I'm not a good person. If I don't do this all, then I'm not fulfilling my commitments. If I don't do this all, then I'm letting people down. I am, I, I am uh, violating some deeply held principle. You know, I'm not meeting and what... And what crazy thing is, so we are speaking about limiting whip, in fact. 
and and, 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 the, and the trick is I have the good fortune to, to work with very, very, very big company and with the board of directors. Uh, limiting whip is much more easy at operation level, so team level, than on the top. Because on the top, explain to them, limit your whip, limit your portfolio of investment. You can't. You're, it's limited. Or maybe sell this. Selling means stop doing this. But in my mind, I still are just changing my words. But it's the same thing about stop starting, start finishing, and, and limit your whip. And it's exactly the same thing. So what? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, and for me, limiting whip is not is is one part of it. I think the the more general concept is. Um, Again, one of the things that extreme programming taught us, right? One of the big changes to extreme programming, uh, the people who say that there's no, uh, there's no project management in extreme programming weren't reading enough books. There's an entire book called Planning Extreme Programming, right? Um, one of the ideas in there was planning to capacity. Uh, and so uh, when I teach, you know, when I take people through this exercise, it's usually in the context of teaching them about getting things done as a way of, of helping them get their workload under control. And in the beginning, it's very easy to see any of those kinds of organization techniques as building checklists and, and, and you know, uh, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, making sure that things do not fall through the cracks, make sure you don't forget anything important, making sure that you balance urgent with significant, blah, blah, blah. And it can be easy to just discount this. It can be easy to just say, oh, this is another bullshit checklist uh, method. Uh, this is for people who don't know how to organize their things. I have my checklists in my head. I don't need this. And it's true that in the very beginning, when you learn getting things done or any of these kinds of techniques, at the beginning, you're just organizing your tasks so that you are more aware of, of doing things and you can find significant things before they come, become urgent, blah, blah, blah. When you reach two or three layers behind, what really happens, the, real, the part of the real power of these techniques is it might be the first time in your life that you have made an honest uh, accounting of your capacity, an honest assessment of your capacity. It might be the first time that you confront the notion that you are in fact not superhuman, that your capacity is finite, that it's limited. And even before you limit whip, limit whip is another way to get there. But even before you limit whip, just recognizing that your capacity is finite and taking that idea seriously. And even better, recognizing that your capacity is probably lower than you believe it is. In fact, breaking that illusion makes a big lightweight approaches to software creates a big change because one of the most common failures is when people do refuse to change their plans to match the measured capacity of the group, whatever the group is, the system would say. So even when they measure the capacity of the system, they throw the number away because of course the number is always too low. I can't say that to my director. I can't say that to my shareholders. I can't say that to my market. I can't say that to my sales team. Because everybody knows that we need to be, we need to um, deliver more, whatever that means. We need more throughput, however you measure it. And that the, one of the, the, if a client is not prepared to confront this reality, then the discussions we have to have are very different. The training we have to have is very different. The workshops have to be very different. And if they all confront this reality, if they already understand that their, their capacity is finite and that their capacity is lower than everyone wants it to be, then often there's nothing to teach them. Then it's just technique. Then they already understand the philosophy and they would just adopt these ideas on their own. And all of a sudden, all of these XP practice, scrum techniques, Kanban techniques, all of that stuff makes sense already. And it's just a question of showing them technique and they do it. But this, this illusion that, uh, that we can go faster and that we can go faster safely, that we can sustain that speed. That, that, again, that's a, I, can teach, I can teach techniques as a way of discovering this fact or we can limit whip as a way of discovering this fact or we can learn the elements of getting things done and do this 
uh, lifetime projects, you're going to die before you finish it exercise. They're all nice ways of leading to that same confrontation that you are trying to go faster than you should. So one of the, the, the single most popular tweet in my accounts history is, if you, are you worried that TDD is slowing your programmers down? Don't worry, they probably need to slow down. Yeah. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, that's true. And uh, uh, every so often somebody new will reply with, um, you can't sell this at my work. And then my own, I mean, I, I understand how you feel. One of, the, uh, one of the unfortunate responses is that the truth doesn't care whether you believe in it. The truth is still true if you believe in it or you don't. Have and some the bottom line is that most people, are, most people are going faster than they can. And, and you bring the point very, very rapidly just to make the work visible, focus on alignment, trust people, and coming with everything you told here, you, you say. And you get very rapidly on results. And then you have the customers coming up, oh, this is working, this is clever, but we're working since two years. Yes, but one thing here, we have to really be honest. If I, came, if I come to you two years ago and I explain, let's do a program, this will cost you 20 million euros, and we will see what happened. <laughs> would you sign? Never. Okay. Failure is part of a deal. Mistake that we often make in many of the things that we've talked about today. So we've talked about sort of breaking people's illusions and trying to find the areas where their expectations mm -hmm. don't match well with what we believe will happen as a way of trying to, I guess, evaluate whether the client, the company is a good fit for these lightweight approaches to working. And I think one mistake that the larger community continues to make is that they use these, even if they do these things, and even if they do them well, they frame it a little bit like, this is a way to find out that the client is stupid and is going to make a huge mistake, and I need to tell them how stupid they are and what a mistake they're about to make, so that I can be the hero to stop them from making a mistake. Um, and I admit, I, you know, I, if you go back 15 years, that's probably me. Um, I felt like it was my duty to stop them from doing something stupid that was going to waste a lot of money and create a lot of heartache. And I think one thing that we need to do and that I hope we'll do more that I'm inviting everyone to think about is to approach this with a much more compassionate stance and to recognize that there are very, I, when I say good reasons, I don't mean good reasons in the sense of justifications. I mean, there are, it shouldn't be a surprise that people think this way. It shouldn't be a surprise that somebody in a director position, in a vice president position, in an upper management position would have this view on, what, on how Lean, Agile, Kanban, Scrum, XP should help them because they've risen in an organizational structure that is still deeply rooted in these other ways of, of thinking in this economic system, which is inherently either waterfall or chaos in, in these structures that are inherently not what we expect. That's part of the reason why they are not, why they don't seem to understand what lightweight approaches will give them. And if we, if we approach that with compassion and say, look, I understand why you think that way. Uh, I can understand how you got there. I can see the reasoning that led you to that conclusion. Uh, but I can tell you that that's not what's likely to happen. And I'm sorry that you, I'm sorry that the picture in your head doesn't match what's likely to happen. How would you like to proceed? So one way that we can proceed is by making some experiments so that you can see what really is going to happen so that you can readjust your expectations and then decide whether you should expand the scope of experiments or limit them to here because the rest of the organization is not ready for it or I'm not willing to make that huge fundamental change in how I run my business, whatever it is. Many people who want to be coaches who call themselves coaches will conclude that the client failed. The client will conclude that Agile failed, Scrum failed, Kanban failed, whatever. And I think they're both I think they both have it very wrong. I think that instead, 
it's more that we found the limits of what we can achieve in the current structure. And that as long as we have this feeling that somebody failed, then it seems like the most sensible thing to do is just to say, ah, I'm going to walk away now. What a shame that we wasted 10 million euro. I'm glad it wasn't my money. At least, I, at least a million euro of that went into my bank account. So I'm very happy. And I can just move on with my life. Um, eh. I, I think we need to have significantly more compassion for that and say that, look, um, this doesn't have to succeed everywhere. It can still succeed somewhere. And if we have clear understanding of what successes can mean and how that can help individual people, that can be a good thing. It used to be, I used to feel very bad about the fact that my, the most common outcome of my work with, as a, you know, as a technical level coach, usually in, on, the, on, the, on the order of size of one or two or three groups of mostly programmers and some testers, and the most common outcome was that one or two key people in that organization all shared some of my philosophy, uh, really understood what I was teaching them, found some real personal benefit in practicing what I suggested, um, and then looked around them and said, ah, the rest of these people aren't going to get it. I'm out of here. Yeah. And then I, they go and they find a new place to work. Or they go and they start their own company and try to do it their way. Or they go and try to become a new consultant and then learn all the same mistakes again. One crazy thing is the, the vast majority of people are thinking this way. Have empathy. It's a majority. Don't, they don't want to have pain at work. They want to, everyone wants to do hard work. So you don't need to push something which is obvious for everyone. And it was people have no proportional uh, laziness. They have a naturally uh, proportion to make hard work at work that makes sense for them. Right. Work that they can believe in, work that they can care about for itself. Yep. And so I think that, again, if we keep framing this either as the client failed or, you know, lean failed, um, then, I, then we're just we're going to walk away with this feeling of nothing. Instead of looking at, okay, well, what did we achieve? Um, what were the limits to what we could achieve? Are, do we have the uh, skill, knowledge, expertise to be able to deal with those limits? No? Okay, well, now either we need help or we need to go learn something. Um, but that's one thing that I worry about is that we have a little bit too much this all or nothing feeling of either... Um, it worked or it didn't work or and 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 that's one thing that i would really like to see disappear from our community sometimes i, I, want, I wanted to define what is agile say so why do you want to, to to define agile because if you if you are fair and honest with yourself you sell agile coaching to someone who has no clue what is agile and what is coaching <laughs> you can do whatever shit you want and that's unfair and if you define agile it's good to come with something new afterwards because you reach that level of agile and then you're able to do something new. It's that's what we all expected. And, and back here about role and responsibility, this is a hot topic. This comes every time out. And, and I'm going more, my brain is going more in the way of is the team's responsibility. Uh, in, in a scrum way means a team means the product owner, the scrum master and the developers from the good and the bad. It's not only finger pointing on the product owner or only on, that makes no sense at all. And just having a scrum, I say, I'm responsible for nothing. I'm just here to help. This is undervaluating the role of it as part of this. If you fail, the whole team fail. In putting this, you're reducing the stress of role or responsibility when you have this scrum, master, which is a new name for uh, uh, a team lead and the project manager, First line manager is, yeah. Yeah, li or some, uh, the project manager is a uh, pro pro uh, product owner who is managing the money. No, 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 no. The money is coming in the bucket. That's the team. That's it. Alex, we didn't hear your voice. <laughs> huh? Yeah, but you're talking, you're talking. So I let you talk, but I agree. Yeah, I, I see that. That's, um, like, um, 
yeah, you say that once uh, um, during the during the talk, you say like um, what I like to say that the the coach is uh, it's someone that entering your company and what and his his ultimate goal is to leave as soon as possible the company. And I and I say this once uh, to one of the, my customers, and the customer said, huh? "What? But you just come. Why you want to leave us?" And I say, I don't want to leave you now, but I'm gonna, I want to leave you soon. As soon as soon I'm leaving, best everything gets better. Yeah, this is one thing that I'm actually having quite a lot of difficulty uh, with um, in the last several years because I want to build more of these uh, relationships with clients where uh, I am helping them do things better for themselves where I'm helping them. Uh, it, it has that same goal of, of uh, you know, I, I want you to stop needing me. I want you to simultaneously get the results that you want and to not need me to help you get them as soon as possible. Yep. And um, for a reason I don't yet understand um, it is far too easy to sell training workshops and not as easy to sell the idea of an ongoing advisory relationship. So then I end up with essentially three choices. First choice, I go there, I teach a course on test-driven development because it's easy and everyone thinks they need it. Or I teach a course on introduction to Agile or I teach a course on manufacturing Slack. I go there for one to three days, 20 people in the room. We have some interesting conversations. I show them some tricks. Maybe one or two of them, a light bulb will flash. They'll have some neat idea. They'll go away. I go away. We never talk to each other again. And if we're lucky, I meet that person, one of those people seven years later at a conference and they tell me a couple of interesting stories about why they left the company, blah, blah, blah. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that I go there for three months or six months, spend four days or five days per week, eight hours per, well, six hours per day if it's a sensible company on site. And in the beginning, it's a lot of talking, talking, talking and pushing them to change things. And then gradually it just becomes me standing in the corner, mostly waiting for something to happen and other people feeling nervous about the fact that I'm standing in the corner, mostly waiting for something to happen because they can see like in the taxi, they can see the meter clicking in euros every minute that I'm standing there and I don't seem to be doing anything. So then they either feel stressed because they're not getting value from me or worse, they get rid of that stress by inventing problems for me to solve. Eh, not very happy with either of those. All right. And then the third option, actually the third option is the one I can't seem to figure out. The third option for me is to build relationships with, with clients one-on-one -on -one or in small groups and advise them every so often. Maybe in the beginning start by meeting with them once a week, once every two weeks and, and discussing problems and then helping them. In the beginning, I'm getting to know their philosophy. They're getting to know my philosophy and we're finding the areas where we're aligned. And then assuming that the alignment is strong enough, then over time, it's just, it mostly becomes me helping them discover the, pro the solutions to their problems that they already know, helping them get out of their own way, helping them feel more confident in doing the thing that they know that they should do. And that's the part that I'm having difficulty selling because, actually, I don't know because. That's the, the thing, thing that I'm having difficulty saying because this, I don't know why they buy it and why they don't. I have, but like you have different customers. I, I would love to have customers like this. I have one that is already two years. I'm with them and uh, sometimes I come to them. I'm a full week with them and then I'm not anymore for four, two, three months. And then I come back to say hello, what's happened and thing. Or they can't contact me and and I come there and I talk and uh, we, we work on, we figure out on what they're doing because anyway, they are very, very slow mission at government. Um, so they don't tend to have someone full time because it's very slow and it's fine. And it's, it's good. And I like it. And every year they, they renew, they say, don't forget, we keep you for the next year and next year and next year. 
I'm fine with this. I know I have a 10, 20% with them. That's cool. And, and a lot of company, they, they tend to take a coach like they take a developer. They take that person and say, okay, here's a contract. You're here for two years with us and you're working with us. And you say, yeah, but you know, I don't want to have fix. I prefer we say, okay, I'm going to be max with you 80%. Let's say like this. And then we figure out. Maybe sometimes I would be only just here 10% and sometimes I would be 80%. And, but they tend to plan to, to see you normally, you see you 80%. And when they don't see you 80%, but much less, they say, what's happened? And it happened uh, like the first year, the customer, I said to him, I'd say, as soon as I'm leaving, more, you are happy and I'm happy because everything will be fine and you'll be able to do yourself everything. And a student did see me like 40%. And he see me on the, on, the, on the office once and he say, Alex, what's happened? You just hear very, very little, just 40%. And I say, yeah, but everyone is on holiday. Why should I stay here? And he say, oh, now I understand what your philosophy is. I understand and I like it because you stay just when it's needed, not just staying. And I say, yes. And this is the difference. And this is the difference between a coach, a true coach, and a consulting. A contractor is coming there, you say 100%, you stay 100%, you're doing shit or you're doing anything, you stay a lot. And one of the customers that I, I went to follow with, uh, it was not with Pierre, but Pierre sent me, was in, uh, in Brazil. And I arrived there and they hired like hundreds of coach. There were um, agile technical coach, agile coach, lean coach, mindset coach. There was a lot of coach for a big bank there in Brussels. Huge. Too much people. And the coach were in silo. So that's really the thing. Hey, what's happening here? And, and I arrived there and I said, because he didn't find enough coach, because the market, European market, cannot provide you 100 coach, agile coach. It just doesn't exist. We're not enough. They hire a big company like Accenture or Tata Consulting, you know, this huge company. They come with a big truck of a lot of coach, yeah, agile consulting, not coach. And they were there. And the two first months, the people there were just listen and follow what the consulting was doing. And I come there and I, I, was, I was like in a retrospective. And I see all the people there and the, the coach was facilitating. And I say at the end, and I say, is there a Scrum Master here? Yes, me, I'm Scrum Master. Ah, okay. When did you follow the training for Scrum Master? Oh, two months ago. And why are you not facilitating? Ah, because the coach said that I need to listen. Next month I can start. I say, no, I have a good news. Next retrospective, you do. The retrospective is not doing. You start now. It's not you. It's your time to do it. And when you see things like this, and after the customer say, "Oh, the agile is not working with me." Yeah, of course it's not working. You're not hiring the correct person. That is first things. Thinking that huge company like this can bring you uh, a good amount of coach so you can be faster is a mistake. It's the first mistake. And of course. Uh, one of the things I like to, to say to, to the customers, I say, I just should never you be being your goal. It should be a mean of something you're trying to achieve, but never your goal. If it's your goal, I have a good news for you. Stop it. You will spend less money. I, yeah, I think this is exactly the kind of, so the two parts, one, the one, of course, of, uh, uh, I'll just, I remember it was a, uh, one of my big clients, we were talking about how to do something. And one of the guys uh, pointed to some part of the product and said, uh, I will shake my sleeve and out will come some Romanians and they will solve the problem. Yeah. And I think that, you know, many people have this attitude towards uh, agile. I will just shake my sleeve and out will come some agile consultants and they will solve the problem. Um, I guess that, I guess that, that way of thinking is not going to go away soon. There's something... No. There's something built into the system of how companies succeed 
that perpetuates this way of thinking and we're not going to solve that problem soon. We just hope that the people who think that way die sooner and the ones who replace them think differently and maybe that's the best we can hope for. Um, and, uh, but that comes back to that, the, the point about there's something about the interface between us and the economic system that is fundamentally, where there's a fundamental discontinuity and that is all that I feel like is always going to limit what we can achieve. And I think that the earlier that we come to that conclusion, maybe the better it is for our own sanity, because then we can think of it less like they hired the wrong people or whatever. And to think of it more like, okay, uh, I can understand why you thought that was going to work. I've never seen that work. What makes you believe that's going to work? Let's talk about that. And maybe in the process of having that conversation, we can find one little area of alignment that takes us one step closer towards me being able to help them. And I think that what I really don't understand is what is it about either the economic system or about the structures that make companies succeed that cause them to feel very comfortable spending 25,000 euro on training, but not spending 20,000 euro on the kind of coaching that you, that you two and I both would rather do. That's the, that is, if I, there's, if there's one big open question in my life that I wish I could find an answer to, I'd like to find an answer to that one. Why are they so prepared to spend 25,000 euro to train people to do TDD, but they are not prepared to spend 25,000 euro to figure out how to make TDD do something useful for their teams, how to make lightweight approaches do something useful for their groups, how to make it do something useful for their company. And I hope the answer is something more than just uh, because if I sprinkle money over there, I mean, no, one of the answers is that if I sprinkle money over there, then I can pretend that I did something. And when it fails, I can pretend that I don't have responsibility because I gave them money. They should have solved the problem. I understand that. I'm hoping that we have a better answer than that because I don't know how to fix that. Yeah, one of my customers, uh, I was there, I was doing the, the coaching, agile coaching, and, and I say, okay, now it's time. Uh, I'm going to start to work with the team, and uh, I'm going to do uh, having uh, some paid programming session with the teams. And, friends. and I did for one developer, the second developer, and then uh, uh, one of the manager came in and say, what are you doing there? And I say, I'm coaching the, te the team on agile pra uh, development practice, TDD, uh, and all this fancy stuff. Uh, and, this, and they say, oh, no, but you have no right. They say, why? I, I don't have right. Oh, because uh, it's not on your contract that you're doing any development. You do, you need, you're you here for, for agile coaching, but not for developers. And I say, I yeah, but that's part of it, why we should have a different contract for this. I say, yeah, we need yeah. to uh, make a different contract. You come in I as have... a developer, not as a coach. And I say, come on. Yeah, I had a similar experience where somebody at a client asked me after they discovered that I was starting to write code with somebody, they literally asked me, well, I mean, do you, do you have the skill to work on this code? And I just started laughing. And yeah. the person I was with who was my sponsor at the local organization, we just looked at each other and said, well, I, I've been teaching people how to do this stuff for 15 years. Uh, I'm probably one of the best in Canada at it. And my colleague said, yeah, I would say the same thing. So that, I mean, that, that's a simple miscommunication. I can kind of understand that happening. Somehow people have this picture in their head that that's what an agile coach does. We have some responsibility for that. Um, fine. Yeah. But uh, I still would really like to understand why it is that people find it so easy to spend this much money for someone to read a book to them for three days instead of spending this much money uh, experimenting with something that could deliver them so much more value. Is it really as simple that they overestimate the value of hiring someone to read a book to them for three days? Or is it that they underestimate, or is it as simple as I know what I'm getting and therefore I'm willing to pay more for it? that the certainty, even if they're wrong, is enough to make them comfortable? Because people would rather be wrong than uncertain. 
I'm hoping that there's a better answer than those things because I don't know. I guess that, I guess that procurement issue. Oh, that's even because worse. You, yeah. when you discover it, yeah, because sometimes you have managers or maybe team members, oh, I want to work with Pierre, I want to work with this. And then the leaders, and they try to convince the, the leader who has a budget, just, hey, that's all right, that's all right. Okay, let's do this. Then you have the first interviews, that's okay. Now I hand over to procurement. Then you say, oh, damn. <laughs> right, because there's no box, there's no checkbox for what I do. Or, yeah, or and, and, and then, this oh, that Alex described, where you, you stray outside the agreement and they say no, instead uh, of. Wow, uh, we can now, do more. Now. Let's have him do more. You know, I'm coming from that area, so I know how, how the game is played. So I give this. But sometimes procurement then start to make a call for proposal. And then you have all these Accenture, uh, McKinsey coming up. And, stay, and then they hand over to them. And sometimes yeah. I'm advisor for McKinsey. Or I, I, I say, what's happening? And, and this is quite often the case. Is oh because they have a good brand, so I, I trust them too. Or maybe there is some kind of security behind, uh, some kind of okay. If if we fail, the company can pay for it. And so it's a double game. It's a hidden game. You don't know all the the, the rules of the game. We are still in. We come to to to, to fix that problem, and there's a complete different game in in the back doors. And and the best thing is. I have a, a leader which was a former developer. So ten years after, I say, "Oh, Pierre, can you come back? Let's do it properly now." You see, uh, what's the deal? I don't care daily rate. Can, what can you come? <laughs> I'm coming Monday, and then you tell me, and again, you're not overrating, and you just the fair price, and and then you have huge results because it's people, it's trust based. And they know they want to know because they know how you, how you're thinking. Maybe oh you're you're, you're bizarre, right? <laughs> the way you think is different, but it's good because uh, the rest we know. We know our, our guys are smart. You need to think out of the box, more typology than taxonomy, right? This kind of thing. And yeah, and when you have the procurement process into it, this is linear. This is follow the rail, and, and the guy there is. Then you have to go in that system, and that system is a wrong system. Procurement is a, is a nightmare. Yeah, but you know, you know, JB, uh, now in Switzerland, it's, it's starting to change. Uh, I started with us that with that story of agile technical coaching. It's probably already two or three years. And when I speak, I, I started people were watching me and they say, "No, you can't. You 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 either a developers, either a coach, but you cannot be the both at the same times, and it's gonna not gonna work." And and now. This year, uh, it's starting. This year, it started. I started to work with it, a company. They hired me as an agile technical coach. Uh, we're doing a lot. We we some more programming, TDD, uh, uh, architecture session, and so on and so on. And, and the team is learning and improving. Uh, and I I just signed yesterday for another contract for another big watch company that wanted to. Uh, uh, they needed not an agile coach just, but agile and technical coaches. So that's great. So it's mean it's start to think. But all this company, maybe they don't know one thing. And uh, and and this um, was uh, Mashud Badar, the, um, one of the guys of Codurance was saying to me uh, last year at the um, Craftsmanship Conference in London. It is say all these companies hire us to come to them to coach technical staff, uh, TDD architectures, good things, and so on and so on. But they miss something. The best of the employees will be so good that if they make shit there, they will leave. And it's true. If it starts to be boring because you can hire, you can, uh, um, yeah, you can have still start to have only a few of the people working there that become good developers, craft, uh, really good craft, they will leave the company because they find out that where they are, it's not good, but other place, it's better. And that's the dangers we bring. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that goes back to what we discussed earlier about how yeah. when I started to observe this happening in my, you know, in my uh, coaching work, it used to really frustrate me. And then I gradually made peace with it, that that's a, that's a signal about something going on in their environment that either I don't know yet how to fix 
that I don't have the response, you know, then maybe you take the Jerry Weinberg approach of, um, or that genuinely, I just don't know what to do there. I end up stuck a little bit in this, in this uh, one way that I try to make this system work is to use the training as a starting point for the interesting discussions. So even if I do three days of training on something like TDD or rescuing legacy code, something like that, there, there will be two hours during that period where we discuss the more interesting questions. You know, we've been talking about coding techniques and all this kind of stuff, and that's all very pleasant and that's helpful stuff. And you should all go away and practice it and learn it better. And, and you'll find that your life will be easier as programmers. Now, now tell me the 37 reasons why this isn't going to work. What, like what's now, can we get into some of those discussions? So what ends up happening is that the, the pure technical coaching becomes a gateway it becomes a way to start the, because I'll notice something strange. I suggested about why that is. You tell me some strange story about some weird person, some weird rule, some weird policy, something like that. Some obstacle in the organization that stops us from doing what I believe is obviously the simplest, most reasonable, most sensible thing. Or I ask questions like, couldn't it be as simple as this? And then you tell me why it can't be that simple. And those discussions start to move in the direction of finding these deeper problems and, and start to deal with them. Not even particularly deep problem, but just problems that are a level or two below the code. And then of course, you know, the benefit of that is that I can earn your trust and maybe then at some point we can do some more, some work with more impact later. And the downside, the risk of that of course, is that we find out in the first 15 minutes of discussion that I'm talking to the wrong, I'm not talking to the person who can help solve the problem. And I know how to talk to the person who can solve the problem. And you don't know how to talk to the person to solve the problem because that's not what you do. So then you have to talk to your manager who has to talk to their manager. And maybe if I'm lucky in three years, somebody will come back to me and ask me a question. And, and is this really the best we can do? Pierre, is that what you're telling me? That this is how it is? This is the best we can do? No, oh, that's life. Uh, that's the same cool. answer. So that's the best we can do? On my side, I would say that mostly it's, uh, I, I, I'm trying to pass sometimes with the big guys on the top, the executive, and, and, and try to explain that uh, their problem, it's us problem too. And um, if they're doing a mess, downstairs is a mess too. So um, they need to start to understand how we need to work together. And it's not uh, one side and another side. But fortunately for me, I start to have customers that are interested in the way I'm working, and what I'm bringing to, the, uh, to them. And maybe it will give me experience to talk with companies that doesn't understand this. Um, I think um, Pierre and, um, and GB, um, I think we will need to, to stop because it's like something like two hours we're talking. We beat all the records. Uh, I probably will uh, cut the, the video in two pieces because no one will listen to us for two hours. I don't know. We can make the, the try, but... Uh, yeah, I was listening the whole time, so certainly that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I was listening to myself half the time, so it's fine. I know. Uh, on, on, on Zoom, I, they don't have the stuff, but I, yesterday I found another video conference uh, uh, software. It was called Meet. And he was uh, measuring the time each of person were talking. Uh, I don't like it. <laughs> no, uh, I neither, neither do I. Here. I'm not sure why we would dislike that idea, but uh... no, no, you have, you have people uh, they love to pose a lot. So when I, uh, I do edit, editing with Agile Praxis, so we have usually, but I love giving people the freedom to speak, the, the time. I hate when people say, no, "Now you have two seconds." It's, yeah. No, even in, even with developers, you have extra extra that can speak. So we are extra, so it's easy for us. But when you have interest, they need they need two two hours to warm up, right? So, <laughs> and but just one point that maybe it's not on the record doesn't matter is we are facing evolution of agile coaching. Uh, one is agile coaching is not a solo solo performance. Meaning uh, you, when you go in in organization, you have to have one guy at least for the top and maybe several others on the bottom. 
which is part of the same team, because uh, you're rapidly branded operational. So meaning it's on the top that don't listen to you. And, and, and back to your point is, uh, when I coach coaches, I say, you will have a very interesting job, but a lot of frustrations. And the big frustration may be, you will work one day and you say, I did nothing, but I'm exhausted. Yes, yes, and that's a good sign. And say why? Because your job, you're very, very focused on everything, a full day, eight hours. And how, how the people interacting, why they speak. And not only analyzing, you, you're focused. And you need to speak with other coaches to breathe. So much of our time was speaking in a coffee corner, drinking tea with other coaches, just to super, make a supervision, which is coaching coaches, to avoid having problems with the coaches. If something is not really well rated, but that's a big point. That's yeah, where we come as and I do still have a very solo approach to the whole thing that just is an accident of the fact that I mostly don't want to travel too much and stay in one place for very long. So I recognize that there are some. That's part of the reason that I, I'm, I'm trying to take advantage of this current global tra travel disruption to see if we can build more of these relationships remotely. It, uh, it might, I might not be able to earn trust quite as quickly as in person, but uh, it doesn't take as long as people think. Uh, it's like, different. It's a great opportunity to to see how we can work like this, and we not we yeah we less traveling. That is this year I, I travel very little compared to the other years. Like I travel as much that I can go around the the, the world uh, two or three times. So it's a big it's a big difference. Yeah, don't misunderstand me. I still want to come back to Europe. I still like I still like our apartment in Stockholm. I would like to do that again. Just not going to happen this year.